Okay, so we'll get going, and I'll, uh, it's really good to know where people are. It'd be really interesting to see how you feel at the end of the webinar. Do you feel more informed? Um, I'm going to guess that the majority of you are. Um, uh, Jatinda said no knowledge of this and irritated that goalposts are constantly changing. I don't think the goalposts have actually changed that much, which will be happy to know, Jatinda. I think I think the ambition from the CTC was very large, and they, what they're trying to do makes a lot of sense. They haven't just quite got there yet. So I think actually what we're seeing right now is kind of an interim position and the full single assessment framework, I think, will evolve over time. So I think there are things, there are predictions I've got at the end, which tie into what we saw during consultation where the CQC have tried to be very ambitious, so have reeled back a bit. Uh, but I think there will be things coming uh, in the future. So um, I don't think the inspections are going to be massively different for now but they have said what they're going to focus on. Anyway, I'm getting way into the webinar before I've, I've even got going. So good morning, everybody. Sorry, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex O'Neill. I am the uh, the Director of Regulatory and Professional Services for Gilio Software on the Dental Division. I've uh, been here for in two months time or in about six weeks time, it'll be 10 years at Code and Agilio. So just out of interest, has anyone been, who's been watching these webinars since 2014 when they started? I wonder how many people we've got here who are members who've been with us that long and, and been following this, this evolution. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what people say in the chat on that one whilst we move on. So let me get onto my slides. Um, just a little bit about Agilio quickly. Um, you know we've we've been very lucky to have great investment from uh, moving from code uh, joining forces with uh, isofarm and becoming a gilio software for um, for, de for for dentistry and um, you can see the whole world of products and services that we offer um uh, from I learn, I team, I plan, I manage, I service, I uh, I think I already said I team um so so we've uh, the idea is that you know my my department's probably about coming up to 30 25 people something like that and let's say 75 percent of the department's ex practice managers so we've all lived that life uh, and we we know what it's like to be in practice so generally our our kind of mission is always to make sure that people don't have to deal with the stuff we needed to deal with so through our products and services, how can we make it easier? So I team for as a good example, um, you know, paper holiday requests are can be a nightmare to manage. So if you've got this in an HR system where people can submit the requests and you can see very quickly who's in, who's not in, and you can authorize as a practice manager, that's the sort of thing I would have found invaluable. Moving on to the CQC single assessment framework, as of today, uh, on, uh, or as of yesterday, uh, we've got new style inspections are underway. As of the 13th of May, um, as of the 13th of May, uh, we've got new style, uh, we've got new style reports, we've got focus areas published by the CQC. So they've told us what they're going to focus on during their inspections. Um, registrations are suffering from delays. Histor this is seen about Registration should take about three months. They've been taking about six months. Uh, so over the last sort of, this is what we have seen. We do know that the CQC have put more resource on this now. And we have um, we have uh, a lot of registration because we do an outsource service where we will do a registration for people. Um, we are, we've got a lot that are mid flight now and we are seeing what that update is so i haven't got a a, a, a the, the last few ones have taken five to six months something like that so uh yeah have taken five to six months something like that we we will keep you up to date on that one but i would be prepared for it to take up to six months so if you're planning to open a practice plan that the cqc process is going to take six months and you need to start three months earlier. Registration is just for new providers. It is, uh, it is, or if you're changing your registration or things like that. So yeah, so the, so the stuff about new providers here as well. Portal issues being reported to Agilio. I've got some slides on that. We're going to cover it. Sector specific guidance. We do have sector specific guidance from the CQC. It's, it's not got the historical level detail we used to get in guidance. Uh, they are, the single assessment framework is about aligning registration with, um, 
inspection, ongoing inspection, and having one framework for assessment, but it's also about having one framework assessment for the whole of healthcare, which is a really good thing for the CQC to try and bring in everything together. What we've fed back to the CQC, which have been very open uh, of listening about, is that we feel like we've lost a bit of granularity in the guidance. Um, uh, we're not quite clear how the CQC will move to more frequent assessments. They've said with this rollout of the single assessment framework, they are sticking to the 10% model. So they're only inspecting 10% of practices per year, but also in their strategy, they've said they want to move from being a point in time regulator to a um, to a multi-point ongoing regulator. And that, that to me, I know, and we heard conversations that they were gonna try and move towards maybe well, I don't know for a fact, but it was very, it looked very strongly like the CQC were going to try and move towards like 30% a year or something like that. That hasn't happened. I do feel like that's going to come at some point. Um, assessment of clinical outcomes, we'll cover that just because this is something that's been included in the quality statements. And I'll cover what quality statements are um, uh, and how you deal with those questions, because assessment of clinical outcomes is not something that we really do. Clinical records out, uh, auditing isn't looking at your clinical outcomes. Uh, clinical outcomes auditing is, but that is not something that's standard and it's not something that's on the CQC required list of audits at the moment. Uh, but neither is antimicrobial auditing, which the CQC are looking at on pretty much every inspection. So the one another thing we've fed back to the CQC is, is we think there should be an increase in clarification on whether the antimicrobial audit is considered mandatory because I think last year it appeared on 98% of inspection reports as something practices were doing or not doing. They won't breach you if you don't do it, but they will ask to see it on every inspection. And I feel that's a bit of a mixed message. How do you guys feel? Just out of interest, does that feel like a mixed message around antimicrobial auditing, asking for it on every inspection, but it is not on their mandatory lists of audits? Uh, interesting to see what your thoughts are on that. Um, potential, potential alignment issues over environmental sustainability. Um, so environmental sustainability, there isn't really a requirement for private practices to do much around this beyond HTML 701 changes, uh, which we saw last year with the switch to majority tiger bags from clinical waste bags. Um, but they're asking everyone to to make statements about their positions on environmental sustainability when they register. So there seems to be a bit of a mix up around that. And we have and we have fed that back to the CQC. Um, so, yeah, most people are saying it's confusing. It's a mixed message. I do know that one DSO is one of the largest DSOs in the country have made it mandatory for all their practices to do the antimicrobial audit because the CQC are asking for it in every inspection, um, which I'm not sure is is I, I can completely understand that because you wouldn't want it to appear on your report to say we're not doing this. However, however, should it appear on your report at all if it's not mandatory? Because I think there's enough regulation to deal with, maybe. But we've fed this all back to the CQC and they've been really, really open about it. So I would the, the culture there is great. They're very open to feedback. Uh, so um, what am I going to cover? Uh, I mean, I've just given you a pretty much a nice summary of everything that's in the webinar. So we're going to look at the CQC strategy and the initial interpretation that we did here. We're going to look at the single assessment framework, what that means, a bit of historic versus current guidance and what we're seeing right now, uh, the inspection format and content from the 13th of the 5th. And I want to show you the research that we do here at Agilio. I think being the largest compliance provider and having two and a half thousand practices using iComply, we we are able to have a fantastic research team uh, who really stay on top of this stuff and 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 produce internal reports on a monthly basis that enables us. I think someone said in the chat, will we see changes reflected in iComply? Yes, we're already doing it behind the scenes. We've changed the report in iComply. You've now got a quality statement report. We've changed that over and we are constantly changing activities and doing subtle changes in the system to guide you in the best way to meet your uh, regulatory requirements. That's what we do for you. Uh, so we, we are on top of that. So we're gonna look at the focus areas and the research methodology, we're gonna talk about registration delays and tips, and then predictions for the future. So just a little bit of a timeline, very quickly, I'll I'll scooch through this. Uh, the CQC pretty much started inspections in, in 2010, and between 2010 and 2015, it's what I, it was the, interesting stage of inspections. When I when I used to present around that time, I'd, I'd ask people, you know, 
have you had an inspection by the CQC? So 2011, something like that, please put your hand up. And in an audience of 150 hands would go up. And then what I'd ask people is, please keep your hand up if you're, if you're inspecting you anything about dentistry every single hand would go down. Uh, between 2010 and 2015, we didn't have dental knowledgeable people inspecting practices, and we, but we had a very, very high pass rate. So almost everyone was passing an inspection. We weren't really getting pulled up that much on everything, probably because the people who were inspecting us didn't know what was right or wrong. And at the time, um, I, I, I have had inspections where all they would do is look at, have you ticked the audit? And then they would pass you. So as a profession, we also felt that auditing at the time, people felt auditing is not important because all I need to do is put a load of ticks on a sheet and I will pass an inspection, uh, which is how, a, in my experience, how a lot of people felt at the time. So in 2015, this completely changed. We got the fundamental standards. Uh, we got uh, good governance in the regulations and we had to do audits and increase and do quality improvement. All of this stuff we now take as standard was brand new in 2015. And because of that, overnight, pretty much 1st of April 2015, 20% of practices started failing the inspection because they did not know how to audit. They didn't. We saw a massive dip. And then obviously we didn't see it in our members. We saw it in the general profession because at Agilio, we're always looking a year ahead, two years ahead, and we're always looking at the research and we're making changes ahead of the game, which is why you don't feel it as much in iComply because we're, we're, we're on top of this for you. Um, so in 2018, they took 11 sets of of key lines of inquiry across all sectors and they made one social care set one healthcare set and then what we've seen in 2021 new strategy smarter regulation and we've had dma calls as well in the interim where they were ringing up by the way right now dma calls are paused we are not sure if they are coming back uh, we've asked the cqc for more information on those is that going to form part of this wanting to assess people more frequently, are they going to do the call? So I think the DMA calls are slightly in limbo at the moment. And the last time I looked, the guidance on the website uh, was in the old guidance section and there's no new guidance. Um, so CQC strategy in 2021, um, they released this document and we did an analysis of this. So just going through a, a quick summary, Anita's just said, we've all lived this. Yes, we have. I was, I was there on the ground floor when on the the first lot of inspections and then the second lot. Uh, I was doing more consultancy back then. Um, so analysis, um, this was kind of a summary of what we felt at the time. So this is a few years old now, but I think it's good to set the scene. Summary, clearer definition of what good looks like and outstanding care looks like uh, and what outstanding care looks like that's easily available and used for assessing services. So we were going to get these new quality statements rather than key lines of inquiry, um, new guidance and ratings. Um, and ratings, um, sorry, one second. Uh, and and were we going to, it looked like we were going to get rated. We are not getting rated for now. Uh, it was pushed up to the Department of Health. Department of Health, I think have been very busy and they, I think they've said not for now. So when we get a new government, will we get rated? I think it's inevitable that dentistry will be rated at some point. We almost stick out like a sore thumb. Care homes are rated, GPs are rated. Why are dentists not rated? It doesn't really make sense. Um, so I think at some point we will be rated, but not for now. Uh, they said they were going to move away from relying of a set schedule of inspections, having a regular and continuous view. So this looked like um, change to um, change to assessment, um, change from inspection to assessment, and an increase in frequency. We really there was a lot of rumblings around this increase increase in frequency, which we haven't seen yet. Because if you increase frequency, this is just my personal take on this. If you increase frequency, you need to increase cost. And if you increase cost, um, the CQC runs a balanced book. So essentially, everything that they take from dental registration fees must be used to pay for the dental team. And if they need to pay for the dental team, it must vice versa. So I think right now, dentistry is quite a hot political potato. And I think if they increased from 10 to 30% and it meant a double or a tripling of the fees, I'm sure it wouldn't be that much. I think on top of the noise that we're getting at the moment around dentistry. So I think there's maybe a bit of holding off a few years on that. That's just my personal opinion. Uh, but I, but I, I think that's coming at some point. I think we will see an increase in fees and well, that's more in my prediction section. Um, using artificial intelligence and innovative analysis methods, this means increased use of AI and I've got this in my prediction section as well, but 
in order to be more frequent and use AI, digital submission and things like self audit. So HIW in Wales, every single year, a practice has to do a self audit and send it in. Uh, also on top of that in, um, you know, in social care, they have to do this for the CQC. So uh, I do think at some point, probably in the not too distant future, we will be asked, I've been saying this for quite a few years now, and I, I'm pretty certain that the CQC were looking into this, but it's not happened yet. But I think we will be asked to do a self audit. That's, that's a way of of increasing the volume of information, having some AI analysis on it and not having to necessarily increase cost base and increase fees. So I think that will happen at some point. Um, the rest of the things on this is is not massively relevant to to the, the, the content of this webinar. So you can have a look on that. And if, if anyone has any questions, then feel free to put them in the QA, Q&A column. And that's one thing I will say, if you've got any questions for the end and you're typing now, please put them in the Q&A bit on the chat. So then when we get to Q&A, they're, they're there because I, I won't be looking through the chat to find questions. So outstanding questions back in June 22 was, will, are there any dental specific consultations coming? Um, they did do some engagement with the profession, uh, but it was a very light engagement. And that's because ultimately very little has changed, which we'll, we'll get onto in a, in a bit. Um, but I, as I said, I think more will change, more changes coming. Uh, when will we be receiving any draft guidance? As I said earlier, there is guidance online. I do feel like it's lacking the sort of historical information that was very helpful. And I'm gonna show more on that in a second. From when are we gonna be asked to start doing an annual PIR? That was a question in, in 2021, 2022. It hasn't happened yet. I think it will be coming. Um, is there gonna be new evidence? Um, it looked like the through the consultation period, it did look like there was gonna be new evidence requirements. However, they haven't quite materialized, but I'll, I'll show you where that's come from. Um, and will we be rated? The answer is no, not for now. So just to give a little bit on, for those of you who don't really understand or don't know, so not understand, a lot of people said at the beginning they don't understand, but don't really have the knowledge around the single assessment framework. Essentially, it's they're still keeping with the key questions. So the key questions, mm -hmm. are you safe? Are you caring? Are you effective? Are you well-led? Um, are you responsive? Um, so those are the key questions. Underneath each of those key questions historically have been what we call the Chloe's, the key lines of inquiry. So uh, so S would be the safe key question. Then under that, you'd have S1, S1.1, S, and you'd have like these questions. Does the provider do this? Does the provider uh, maintain a safe practice? Um, does the provider carry out risk assessments? They're not quite as granular as that, but it's, it's those sorts of questions. Um, what they've done is they've done a lot of research into what people want from a healthcare service and also what they know the regulatory requirements are. And they've rephrased this as what they call we statements. So the we statements are we do this, we do that. So it's, so it's a lot easier to assess people, do you do that? And it's a lot easier to, it's, it's a lot more specific. Uh, and, and also from the patient side, they've also got things called I statements, but I won't go into those. They also, under each under each of those key questions and under each, sorry, under each of the quality, those are called quality statements, the we statements that sit under each key question, they then say there are six potential evidence categories and a certain number of these evidence categories apply to this question. So under one of the, the quality questions, they may say, uh, well, I'll actually move on so you can see that. Um, I'll come back to that. You can see those are the people's experience, feedback from staff, feedback from partners, observation processes, Outcomes is an interesting one, which we'll come to because that's quite new. Um, but they'll say, well, under a particular quality statement, we're not going to be looking at processes. So that guidance is online, but it's very high level and it doesn't really currently say what they're going to be looking at specifically. I don't know if we'll get that guidance, uh, but it did look historically along the way as though we were going to get guidance like that. And we've requested it from the CQC because we think it'd be really helpful for people. Um, so if I'm just going back onto this one, um, so the the old model, registration is a different team to the people who come out and they inspect and they assess you. They're, they're still going to be different teams, but they're essentially going to be using the same framework. So this does indicate that the bar for registration will go higher. And we've seen this in the digital registration forms, and I'll talk more about this in a bit, whereas historically you used to fill out section seven of the form, you used to have to fill out five boxes, explain how you're safe, 
explain how you're effective, explain how you're caring. That's been replaced with answer, uh, answer, say how you meet every single one of the 34 quality statements. So, so we've seen exponential, well, not exponentially, but the registration forms are taking a lot more time to complete. And you probably need a lot more guidance to do it um, or support from someone to make sure that you're getting it right. So I'd say the, the bar for registration has gone up. They're asking a lot more. So there's a lot more where you could say um, an incorrect statement. And what I've seen historically is quite often um, clinicians who've not really run practices before, who've been associates and then gone to register with the CQC without some sort of support from someone like us, they don't know how to answer those questions because they've never run a practice. So what used to be five questions is now 34 questions. So I think the risk of getting something wrong there has increased. Um, so, I mean, for for non for rated services, what they do is they, they say what the level of good is, what they'd expect you to have under each we statement. And then if you meet all of those, then you're allowed to open based on your score equals good, but we are not rated in dentistry. So it's just pass or fail, essentially. Um, and they've got rid of the old report. And after your inspection, there's now an HTML, HTML report published on the CQC website. If anyone here's had a look at those HTML reports, it'd be really interesting to see what people think of them. Um, I've, I've, I've heard mixed reviews on them. Some people like the clarity. Some people feel that they're missing the detail that we used to get historically. But I'm not sure if any of you have been inspected or or had one of those reports. So that's giving an idea of of where the assessment, where it all came from, and where and what they're doing. Um, here's an example of some quality statements, just so you see them. Um, so halfway down the screen you'll see one there monitoring and improving outcomes and this is quite an interesting one because it says we routinely monitor people's care and treatment to continuously improve it we ensure that outcomes are positive and consistent and they meet both clinical expectations and the expectations of people themselves um i when i surveyed 10 dental practice owners that i know not one practice was doing clinical outcomes auditing and trying to use auditing to improve clinical outcomes is anyone here who's not doing a specialist practice actually doing that right now. It would be really interesting to see whether people are doing that or think they should be doing that because this quality statement would indicate that it's something that we should be doing. However, there is no new auditing requirements that have come with the, the framework. Interesting to see what you what you guys say. But you, this gives you an example of, you can see the environmental sustainability question at the, at the bottom as well. That's another one we'll talk about a bit more. Uh, because what is the regulatory requirement there that, that people are inspecting against? But I think we can all agree that these are clearer statements than, than we had in the past. So they've replaced the key question, the key, the key lines of inquiry with quality statement questions, but they've said they're not looking for any new evidence. Um, so just just a little point on the guidance to explain what I mean by this. So when originally uh, in 2015, when we um sorry uh just saw the chat for a second uh, so originally in 2015 when it changed we got this consultation document and as you can see in the document it was actually very very good and helpful for you know this is what this key line of uh, key line of inquiry is uh, key question is covering here are the topics here's the evidence that we're looking for and we thought this was great guidance for the profession um it's very granular it's quite specific and it was really helpful for the changes um when the CQC was sharing information during the consultation period, um, this, these are the slides that they were sharing. Um, and this is really, really interesting. You can see the highlights that you're seeing on this slide was the work that we were doing a couple of years ago to see what was different. So under processes, you can see provider-led audits of processes prescribing antimicrobial and pain relief. Now, a prescribing audit isn't con considered mandatory and neither is an antimicrobial audit. So when we saw this, our based on our experience of developing compliance systems, we and you can see antimicrobial appearing multiple times, we thought, okay, this is becoming mandatory because it's it's almost the inspection right now, it seems like it's mandatory. Um and there were other things in here. You so see you can see at the top staff focus groups, questionnaires or surveys with staff, which isn't mandatory. So we're like, okay, the CQC are going to be expecting new surveys 
staff focus groups, antimicrobial audits going to become mandatory. So this is the sort of stuff that we started preparing. And I think this guidance is brilliant uh, because it's this is safe and it's it's showing what they're looking for under, under the under five of the six um under five of the six evidence categories. And we actually requested, can we have this in guidance? Can this be published? Um, we did think it was coming, but it turned out that it, that it wasn't. And what we've got online is, um, I don't think it's as useful as this, um, which we've fed back as well to the CQC. Um, and you can see on this one on well-led, if you look at the bottom, net zero and carbon reduction objective. So we're, so we're thinking, okay, that, that ties in with the environmental sustainability question. So the CQC are gonna start expecting more things around environmental sustainability. Um, so, I'm not, I'm not going to go into every single one, but you can see, well, the, the point of this one is actually, this one's on a whole, the well-led one's on a whole key question, a whole area, which I thought was great. And then and then this one was digging into infection prevention and control and being a bit more granular. So we thought this was really helpful. And we also thought, I'm trying to see where it says about uh, clinical outcomes as well. I can't find that one, but but clinical outcomes was on that slide as well. So we're like, OK, we're going to need to there's going to be a new audit requirement for clinical outcomes auditing. Um, so the guidance at the moment looks a bit more like this. So when you go on, this is a, oh, one second, when you go on the website. Um, well, this is actually for registration. Sorry, this one's for registration. So if you're registering right now. What, what, what I'm pointing out on this one is if you're registering, these are the the section I was talking about before where you have the 34 quality statements on the provider website, um, on their provider website, um, sorry, on the provider portal, the 34 questions on the provider portal. And it says, explain how you will meet the regulation to do this. And there is guidance there. You can see for a GP service, for a social care provider, for an ambulance service on the other one, GP, social care provider, ambulance service, online primary care service, there's no guidance for dental practices currently. Unless that's changed since yesterday, we have fed this back to the CQC and they said they're going to look into it. But right now, there's not really any guidance on how to answer these questions. And then when, when they're asking questions on things like clinical outcomes, and they're asking questions on environmental sustainability, that causes problems because is that something we're supposed to be answering questions on? So we're getting feedback from people that how do we answer these questions? So I'm going to help you with that on this webinar. Um, so if you actually do want to look for guidance online, you can go what evidence categories, this is on the CQC website, what evidence categories you would prioritise for your, your, your sector, you click primary dental care services, you then you then go into this page and you can see learning culture processes. Also, you can see safe systems and pathways with the key question. And underneath both of those, um, Fran, your mic's on. Uh, and under both of those, uh, you can see um, you can see that processes button. If you click on that processes button, this is what you get, which is which is guidance for every single provider and it's got four bullets on it which if if you compare those four bullets to the slides we were just looking at i think we probably most of us would agree that the slides were a lot more rich in information than, than the guidance that we have so we fed that back as well and asked for more guidance um along the lines of the one on the right there so another thing that we're seeing is that it's it's a little bit um there's a bit of duplication so for consent, consent seems to be covered by four separate questions. So uh, I won't go through this, I won't go through this line by line, but uh, if you just look at the responsive person 4.1, uh, under this particular key question, it says people understand their condition, care and treatment options, including any associated risks and benefits. So so there's a bit of duplication there because that is that is the GDC definition of consent that that uh, people are explained their treatment options, the risks and the benefits of the treatment option, and the and the recommendation of the clinician is literally the definition of consent in the GDC standards. But under the consent question, it just says people's views and wishes are taken into account. So, so there's a bit of duplication there. But the one thing I will say on that is that that this is a unified set of criteria. Um, 
this is a unified set of criteria and can and in a care home obviously this would be more important so so in dentistry we may just need to duplicate our answers a bit which kind of makes sense when they're doing it so so i can understand what the cqc are trying to achieve there i just feel like we need a bit more guidance for dental which is going to help us um in in that scenario uh, environmental sustainability is something i want to talk about because there's not really any requirement for private practices to do anything around environmental sustainability and is there really a requirement for NHS practices? There is to meet the NHS. Um, have I got that? So if you can see on, on this particular slide, uh, the, the fourth bullet point down, it says staff and leaders have green plans in place and staff and leaders are making sure that they're doing net zero care. These are all NHS initiatives that haven't really hit a general dental practice yet. So, so what they've said is, um, so what they've said around this is um, we will not be assessing the environmental sustainability quality question during the first year. Great. Uh, we don't feel like there is a requirement for that, especially for private practices. Um, however, this is this screenshot's taken from the registration form. However, um, the environmental sustainability question is on the registration form. So, so we fed back and said, should it really be there? Or should there be a, a private should there be a private practice question on the form that filters out for private practices? Um, but how would you answer how would you answer this question? So if you need to register and you need to answer this question, um, talk about waste, talk about the the change in HTM 0701, which is to support um, less. Uh, what I'm saying, waste waste that does not need to have a higher level of incineration going to a higher level of incineration. So talk about the switch to tiger bags. Um, so that would be the main way to answer that question. So if any of you are thinking of registering in the near future, uh, then that's how I'd answer that question. It's on the screen right now. Um, you can make it bigger, by the way. There should be a thing to the to the side that should you should be able to make it full screen for you. To, uh, if you want to screenshot it or anything like that, we will be putting this webinar on uh, onto um, onto YouTube as well. So, moving on from that point, um, monitoring and improving outcomes. Um, it's it's a bit interesting that the the one. It's a bit interesting that when looking at monitoring outcomes, the CQC have, have said for GPs they will look at outcomes, but for for dentists they won't look at our clinical outcomes and i think that probably comes from the fact that that not all practices are managing this and also there's a lot more data for gps they have things like quaff scores and stuff like that nhs practices have vital signs um but not much more so how do we deal with this i i do think i think the thing here for me is my one of my predictions is clinical outcomes auditing will eventually become a requirement because actually the quality of the dentistry we give and whether it is effective as a practice is one thing that is there's almost an imbalance there they are not an imbalance like absolutely effectiveness of treatment something like that are looked at in hospitals are looked at at primary care as far as i understand um but in dentistry it's not something that they look at and that's probably i'd say that's that's probably the the most common criticism you hear of the cqc is they don't actually look at the patients so i think this will happen eventually uh, we will just see. Um, so if you're going to answer that question now, because I've said straw polls, every poll I've done has shown that I don't know practices that are doing this as standard. I'd say firstly, we routinely check at the end of the course of treatment that patients are happy with their treatment. Um, and we do annual clinical records auditing and we do patient satisfaction survey. And then obviously there's a bit in square brackets there. If you are doing clinical audits, implant success, root canal, retreatment audits, posterior composites, etc. Um, you can talk about that there. But if you don't do those things, I would talk about um, asking patients if they're happy with their treatment and doing clinical records auditing just to make sure you're following those processes. Um, so um, we are, there's a lot to cover in this webinar, so I'm going to go very, very quickly through these things. So we've got an inspection that has been using the new framework since the 13th of May. There's no significant new evidence to be requested. That's a key point. Um, there is MHRA, there are new things they are looking at, but it's not really linked to the 
there are new things or things that are within their remit that they're going to focus a bit more on or they've not been looking at as much in the last few years to but it's not really linked to the single assessment framework so the first one is mhra registration they are checking that you are checking that your labs are mhra registered and they're also checking that if you are producing medical devices like you have seret machines etc in practice you are mhra registered because you are operating as a lab and you are producing medical devices so I would do that. Um, the um, the facial aesthetics. Uh, it's more about if you are doing. There are certain facial aesthetics that cut, that are regulated activities. Botox isn't, as everybody knows. The um, the two that are are thread lifts and are PRP vampire facelifts. So if you are doing either of those in your practice, you need to make sure that you're getting proper consent, that everyone is trained and competent, including the nurse, and they will be looking at that. They have outlined their focus areas, which I'm going to go into in a minute, and pretty much everything else I've covered, I've covered already. So uh, I'll move past that one. What are the focus areas? So I'm going to go through this probably in about five or ten minutes so this is this could be a whole webinar in itself and to be honest i probably will do this as a whole webinar in itself and i'm going to do this as a series of articles in the bdj as well and i will let members know about this so this is going to be a quick overview of these areas um and there's a lot of info on the slides but i'll just pick on certain bits but you'll be able to watch this back online so this is what they said they're going to be focusing on for the foreseeable future infection prevention and control staffing equipment and pre premises delivering evidence-based care good governance that's pretty much everything that's well led safeguarding consent medicines complaints caring and responsive care are whole key lines of inquiry so at agilio as i said earlier you know the fact that we've got Good investment behind us we've got two and a half thousand practices on board we're probably three times bigger than our nearest uh competitor i would say um we we research and we've always been very research based and we we do this every single month we look at at least 10 inspection reports we trend analyze them we look what's what's going on and this enables us to update the ratings and the priorities in eye comply so you know what's more critical what's more likely to be looked at on an inspection. They're all regulatory things. The CQC could look at all of them, but we put some priorities in there. So you you know, if, if you've only, if you only got half an hour, look at the high priority stuff. Um, so I'm just gonna go through some of these um, to just talk about typical places that people can fall down. So infection and prevention and control. Um, having a written infection control procedures and your team doing something different because they've decided there's a more efficient way of doing it but you've never updated your procedures having the two things not matching or having your procedures not matching the requirements of hcm 105 really really important uh, probably the other most important thing there is your auditing don't not doing your auditing from your desk it's very the number of times i've been into a practice and I've seen an a infection control audit, or our eye managed team see this all the time, an infection control audit when the manager has uh, sat at a desk and done the audit and not actually gone and looked. Uh, so a classic one of those will be a uh, classic question, someone, the question that says, uh, how, what, how good are your records uh, for your autoclave? Do you have all records, one, partial records, two, et cetera, et cetera? Everyone who sits at a desk says they have all records. And then when you go and look in their log books, there was the week that the temp, everyone was on holiday and the temps were in and nothing's been completed. So they've got partial records. Uh, staffing, uh, having a recruitment policy in place that matches schedule three and of the Health and Social Care Act and following it and making sure that your staff files are up to date. Uh, as part of the iTeam service that I mentioned earlier, a really great bit of that service is that the iTeam software enables you to to tag what you have and you don't have and expiry dates of documents so it's very easy in the team to support our IT practices on an annual basis to audit this so they know what's missing so uh, and the CQC when they come in will tech 10 to 20 I mean if you don't have that many team but 10 to 20 staff files for all of this evidence and it's a really easy place to fall down not having a a record that you've done a DBS, not having done the DBS because you've been busy and then never auditing it later and then finding out on the day of the inspection that you forgot to do it and you never followed up on it. So you can have a read of the other points on there, but I'd say those are the main ones, the recruitment policy following it and the documents, equipment and premises. 
you've seen the list there, having a health and safety risk assessment, making sure it's done by someone competent. We recommend if you're going to do it internally, that the person at minimum has done the IOSH managing safely, the three day course. That's what all of our eye managers, that's what I have. Fran, who's just joined the call, that's what she has. Um, and you can see all the other things on there, making sure you've got your electrical installation to get your gas safety certificates, all of these things that are covered in I comply, but good to know. Uh, delivering evidence-based care. Uh, they're basically just going to look at your dental records. Clinical records auditing technically isn't mandatory, but I would always recommend doing it because I'd rather find problems with my associate's records myself than the CQC inspector finding it. Uh, you know, making sure you're following delivering better oral health, whether or not it is mandatory is, is, is always a gray area, but it makes a lot of sense, you know, making sure that you're giving smoking cessation advice, that your clinical that your examinations follow the CG DENT guidelines and you know, uh, making sure that your specialists are up to date with the latest guidance for their specialism, etc. cetera. Um, good governance, I mean, this is huge, uh, but making sure you have a governance system in place, whether it's iComply or another system, obviously I'm completely biased and I'd recommend iComply to everybody because I know how much work goes into it every single day. Uh, but making sure that policies have been reviewed regularly, you've got a strong leader in place who's actually a leader, that you don't just delegate tasks to people who aren't trained, that you put people on, you know, you want someone to be your infection control lead, they are trained as an infection control lead. Aura are fantastic for that, by the way, I always talk about Aura infection control, they do a great course for that. Um, you know, regular team meetings are happening. You can demonstrate quality improvement. Your audits are leading to actions that are dealt with. Those are just not doing those things at really easy places to fall down. Consent, very straightforward, but you know, making sure that you've got treatment plans, especially if you're changing treatments. Um, I saw a post on Facebook the other day where someone had uh, mid mid appointment had decided to do an extra two fillings for a patient and they didn't do a an updated treatment plan and then it got to the end of the treat end of that treatment and the patient basically said well I didn't agree to pay for this and you've not got a leg to stand on when that happens generally um but you know making sure you're getting proper consent treatment plans assigned I spoke about risks and benefits and noting them in in you know making sure that you're saying in the notes this is what the, this is what I suggested that for the patient. These are the risks and the benefits. This is was my this was my suggestion. The patient chose this. They explained to me they understood the risks and benefits. Just make sure all of that's covered off. Safeguarding written safeguarding policy. Make sure it covers covers certain topics. Um, making sure that the staff are trained at minimum to level two. Having a safeguarding lead in place and making sure all the team just know how it works if there is a safeguarding incident. Um, medicines. Uh, a lot about prescription pads, making sure that you've got a system in place for your prescription pads and you've and you and you're accountable for them. You know whether they've gone missing. I won't go into the detail of everything around that. Uh, making sure that you've got really detailed procedures in place. In I comply, we've got the uh, the medical uh, management of medicines policy, which covers all of the points that the CQC have in their MythBuster. Um, um, someone, um, Stephen, someone's asked questions. If you want to put questions in q and I'm just seeing things pop up and I'm trying not to answer them whilst I, whilst I finish this bit off. Um, but you can see on medicine, there's points around that. Complaints, making sure you've got a written complaints procedure. It matches the NHS and the GDC requirements and it is on your wall. Um, and it is on your wall. Um, and, and making sure you, you've got a complaints log in place. Re every practice gets complaints. So a really good question to ask yourselves, and I always say this, is you'll go into a practice and you'll say, have you had any complaints? And they'll go, no, we've had no complaints whatsoever. And they're thinking no written complaints because a complaint is verbal in the GDC standards. So my follow-up question is always, okay, you've had no complaints in the last 12, 24 months? Yeah. How many refunds have you given and why did you give them then? And that's where people generally go, okay, well, there was this person who said this, that's a complaint and you have a duty to log that. So just making sure you've done that uh, and making sure that the team are aware how it gets followed up on and making sure that you're showing that quality assurance loop as well, that you're analysing complaints, you're looking for trends. If you've got, if the same complaints are happening with the same team member, you're dealing with those, etc. Caring and responsive care. Uh, I mean, these are two key lines of inquiry in themselves and I could do a whole webinar on each. Caring practices don't really fall down on. Teams are caring, 
we're in the profession for a reason. We actually like helping people. That's why most of us are in this. Would everyone agree with that? I'd actually say that's what got me into healthcare uh, and ended up it, it's, and that's what's helped why I've ended up in, in management. That's why I've ended up doing this is because I like helping people and almost everybody I know on the team shares that. And I think that's why we're in it. So, so I think that, I think that people, I think caring is something that people don't have to deal with. Um, and the, and obviously you can see information leaflets. You can read that one off the screen. I won't go into everything on that. Uh, so I've, I won't go into this into much detail. This is just giving you an example. These are the sorts of reports we do internally where we look at the trends. We can tell you over the last 12 months, roughly how many times an, an item appears. This is how we update our documents. This is how we do everything internally. And uh, it's also how we update our eye managers. So the most up-to-date compliance managers in the dentistry world, I would say, are our eye managed team uh, who support around 200 practices right now. Um, so if you, um, oh, that has got the wrong price on it. That's an old price. I, I manage is, is, is 239 plus VAT per month. And it's about a third of the price of what it would cost for a consultant to do that work for you. So uh, we surveyed our I manage practices last year and we freed up, on average, we freed up 160 hours. That's a total of one month of management time. And with that one month of management time, practices have ret easily returned the £250 they're paying each month um, and, and have made profit on top of it. So I'm going to put a pop-up on the screen right now. We don't do discounts on iManage because it's literally done at margin. Um, but a pop-up should come up on the screen in a second. Um, but if you are interested in us managing your compliance for you and the kind of person who has access to that information that I've shown... Uh, I would advise click on that, book a demo, uh, and just have a ch it's, well, it's not really a demo, it's it's a chat. Book a chat with the new business team, get a scope, see if I manage is suitable for you, and if it's something that you want to invest in, in order to achieve all the things that are on screen right now. The biggest one, I think, has been freeing up people's time uh, to do whatever they want with it, to invest it in the business or with some practices to spend more time on the golf course. I won't spend too much time on this, uh, but um, I'm, I, it was the thing that I created after hundreds of practices asked me, could I create it? And it's um, it's got the highest satisfaction rate of anything we do at Agilio. It's got world-class satisfaction scoring. So uh, Fran's in charge of that, and uh, she's done a phenomenal job creating the team and, and looking after our eye managed practices. So Oh, just a bit on registration, and then we're pretty much done. Um, I covered most of this, but we've got a new provider portal for registration. Uh, access to the portal can be shared. So you, once you get into the portal and you've started working through the process, you can delegate. You can add email addresses and delegate to people from that. Um, we've i've covered this off you you're now you're no longer doing those five questions you're now answering 34 questions uh, but there's still not really guidance to help you with that so i would i would unless you're very good at compliance if you are registering it doesn't need to be us we do offer this as a service but unless you're experienced in doing registrations my personal advice right now would be use a professional to help you do a registration doesn't need to be us but use a professional because it's there's a lot going on and things can bounce and you can actually end up submitting the whole application and it gets stuck and then you need to do a paper application uh, i mean the, the portal has got a lot better the cqc have been very responsive on fixing bugs on it and they're very responsive at getting back to people with issues with it but there are still some issues with it um and they've changed the documents that they're asking for the policies and procedures uh, they no longer want a complaints procedure submitting, but you can see the list on the screen right now. Um, um, I mean, as I said, they've, they've resolved a lot of the bugs and their response time was about 10 days to emails uh, a month or so ago, or maybe a couple of months ago. It's now two days. They get back to you. They're very, very responsive. There are still some issues with timing out progress not saving, applications getting stuck at the pending status, and then they might ask you to do a paper application, which is very frustrating uh if you've spent time doing the um the other application so just be aware of that um and yeah there's information on there the the cqc are, are all over this getting this working properly 
Um, so just sort of give a bit of an update around registration. But the main thing is the questions, but the portal's mostly resolved now. Um, registration delays, as I said at the beginning, right now, the average that we've seen over the last six months is about five to six months. But the CQC have put 50 new colleagues on registration and it'll be interesting to see whether the ones we submitted two, three months ago go beyond the 12 weeks. We think they will, but we think it's going to start tailing off. But right now, I would assume six months rather than 12 weeks. You can get it prioritised, whether you're NHS or private, if you can explain why in the region you live in your dental practice being opened is is essential to um to the population so if you can explain what's going on um and why and you can make a good case for it they will prioritize it whether you're private or nhs you just need to put it in terms that's not about your business it's about the patients and the population you are serving um so that's good i've just seen that anna lawson sorry i just have to say that just because i as i said i manages my baby that i've been working on for years but i've just seen I, I, anna lawson said i manage is amazing so so I, if someone can put a pop-up up again <laughs> so anna's obviously loving it so if if anybody wants to learn more about it there'll be a, a pop-up will come up again on the screen there we go uh so how to have a smooth application process just assume it's going to take four to six months i would just say six months i've said i'd recommend someone getting support on it. Um, consider how you're going to answer those questions on outcomes and environmental sustainability, because you're probably not doing them right now. That said, by the way, I should have said it earlier, environmental sustainability, I think it's a great thing for a practice to do. We work with Mark Topley. He's one of our partners. He is amazing. If you're looking for a environmental sustainability partner, then I'd highly, highly advise going towards uh, asking Mark Topley to help you with, with CSR. Uh, cust uh, corporate social responsibility uh, and we've got templates that is a CSR policy in iComply so if you want to start doing it and look at Mark's help us write that you can start doing it it is um, it is um, um, yeah sorry I'm getting distracted by the chat again um, yeah it's a really good thing for practices to do so I'm not saying that anyone shouldn't do it I think practices should do it I'm just saying it's not mandatory uh, apart from the the waste stuff, Craig has said I manage is amazing. Well, so thank you, Craig. <laughs> um, so predictions, I've pretty much covered this off. I do think that clinical outcomes will become a thing. I think that this. I think my interpretation is the CQC intended for it to be a thing, but with the portal, with everything that's been going on, um, I think they've scaled that back. But I do think clinical outcomes auditing will come at some point. I think environmental sustainability maybe maybe not i don't know that'll be interesting nhs definitely private not sure i think we might see that scale back a bit absolutely i i i think i'll die on this hill <laughs> but i think provider information returns and your self audits are coming at some point i think if they want to be a multi point in time regulator it's a very easy way to do it without increasing fees as long as they've got the AI analysis in place to pick it up at the other end. So I think that will absolutely come. I think we will see some sort of increase at some point and some sort of fee increase as well, just because of the extra manpower that will be needed. Um, so we're pretty much done. Uh, sorry for going a little bit over there for questions, but um, um, I'd rather go into more detail and just go a few minutes over. So sorry for people for going a, a few minutes over there. Um, so we've covered the CQC strategy and initial interpretation. We've looked at the framework, kind of what the CQC were trying to achieve with it, which I think is great, and um, and how they've aligned registration and ongoing assessment, some of the issues that have come with that. Historic versus current guidance. I do think we used to have better guidance, and I really hope that the CQC bring that sort of guidance back. Um, and we've covered like things like clinical outcomes auditing, environmental sustainability, antimicrobial auditing, which I think will become mandatory as well. Sorry, I put, sorry, we probably could have put that on predictions for the next 12 months. We've looked at the focused areas and the research methodology uh, behind what we do here at Agilio. Registration delays and tips and predictions for the future. So uh, before we go into any Q&A, uh, oh, sorry, some next steps. Pref ensure that your MHRA facial aesthetics is covered. Prepare for delays if registering. If registering, consider how you're going to answer those new questions. And I, I really would use a professional, whether it's us or not us, I really would. Um, 
beware of be aware of the focus areas and the easy mistakes. I did a whistle stop tour of those, but we got loads of webinars on YouTube of and not a lot has changed. If you go through our historic webinars, we're covering this stuff time and time and time again. Things will evolve. Um, and consider engaging a quality compliance partner like us uh, for things like iManage, iTeam, just to help you with everything along the way.